a cause of trivial illness. But the AstraZeneca, what they use, they use a chimpanzee. In other words, a non-human primate adenovirus, which infects uh, non-human primates, but doesn't affect human beings. Now, that's used to carry that RNA into the cells. That adenovirus doesn't multiply. It's just used as a vehicle to get the RNA into the muscle cells. And again, it's the same process. The RNA then codes for the protein. The protein stimulates the immune system. Um, the other, the uh, Johnson & Johnson used another adenovirus. It's a human one, but also one which doesn't cause any illness, adeno26. And the Russian one uses two, an adeno5 and adeno26. But it's the same process. The, uh, the Chinese virus, the Sinopharm virus, that uses actually one of the classical ways. Uh, they grow up the virus and they inactivate it, that's whole virus, and it's obviously the proteins of that virus itself will stimulate the immune system. Now, there are other ways of making uh, viral vaccines. None of them have yet been licensed. These are the three main, or well, actually the two main techniques uh, in, those three, in those three vaccines uh, which are used. So that's a very, very brief overview of how these vaccines are prepared and how they work in stimulating the immune system. Thank you, Dr. Manzi. I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much, Professor Shub, for that explanation. I see that uh, Dr. Anban Pele is ready to go with his slides. And thank you, Dr. Pele. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you can see the slides. Um, I'm, I'm just going to. Uh, uh, take you through the overview of the vaccines that we are, are looking at and some that are coming in that the minister announced. If we go to the next slide, which is uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, you, uh, you can see that this vaccine, which is being produced by the Serum Institute, is called the Covishield vaccine. It uses a uh, viral vector technology. Um, its efficacy is between uh, 62 and 90 percent, depending on the uh, uh, type of uh, uh, trials that, are, that are, um, have been uh, reported on. It's a two-dose vaccine. The uh, dosing interval uh, varies. Uh, in, in some of the trials, it's been four weeks, and can, but it can go up to 12 weeks. Um, it's administered in the deltoid muscle um, with a, a needle and syringe. I think you, 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 you would have seen that on, on TV in, in some of the countries. Uh, it's a fully liquid vaccine, so it doesn't have to be diluted. Uh, the good news about it is that it can be stored between two and eight degrees. The, uh, the side effects are fairly mild to moderate. Um, from, from the reports that we've had thus far, the, uh, the side effects relate to, largely to tenderness in the injection site, uh, headache, fatigue, uh, myalgia, um, uh, pyrexia, and a bit of chills. But these are usually only for a few days. Uh, most vaccines probably uh, have the similar effect in terms of uh, the immune response, and, and uh, individuals may experience these. But uh, again, just to emphasize that these are very mild uh, symptoms. Uh, coming next to the Pfizer vaccine, this is an mRNA vaccine. Its efficacy is 95%. It uh, um, is a two-dose vaccine as well. The dosing interval here is 21 days apart. It's administered in exactly the same way as the, as the AstraZeneca vaccine. This vaccine does require some reconstitution, which means that uh, uh, it'll have to be mixed. And once it's uh, mixed, it, it, uh, it lasts for about six hours. Uh, so very important in our uh, program is to make sure that we have uh, uh, sufficient people uh, to be vaccinated once a vial has been diluted to uh, uh, prevent uh, wastage of, of the vaccine. The, the challenge with the vaccine is uh, that it's stored at minus 70 degrees. At the vaccination site, it can be kept to between 2 to 8 uh, degrees for about 120 hours. The uh, side effects are fairly similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine in, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the most uh, common side effects. They, they have been uh, particularly as they relate to polyethylene glycol, PEG, uh, but I think it's important to bear in mind that this vaccine is currently the most widely used uh, vaccine it's since it was the first one out of the blocks. So we're probably hearing a lot about this, but as the other vaccines are being used, we'll have more information about them. This vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is not registered as yet, but we're certainly waiting for the registration. We anticipate uh, the phase three studies coming out this week, hopefully, which will tell us a lot about the efficacy and the safety 
uh, of the vaccine. Uh, it's given in exactly the same way. The, the great advantage of this vaccine is it's a single dose vaccine. So you don't need to come back for your second dose. Um, and it's stored as well between two to eight degrees. The, uh, the um, uh, side effects that were reported this with this vaccine as well, very mild, similar side effects to the others, uh, you know, pain at the injection side, a bit of fatigue and headache. As I said, very, very uh, short lived uh, from all the data that we have. Then the vaccine that comes out of China, the Sinovac vaccine. Uh, this vaccine is an ina inactivated uh, virus. Its uh, efficacy seems to range between 50 to 70 percent. We don't have uh, large trials to, to rely on here, and some of the small trials is what we're reporting on. Uh, it's not registered here yet, uh, um, but uh, uh, it is being used in a number of countries. It's a two-dose vaccine, 14-day uh, interval in between, administered in exactly the same way, uh, and is also stored between uh, two to eight degrees, uh, and the reports about side effects are very similar. Uh, coming to the Sputnik uh, uh, 5 or V vaccine, uh, this vaccine is, is produced in Russia. Uh, this is an adenovirus uh, vector vaccine, efficacy around 92%, a two-dose vaccine as well, with a 21-day interval in between. It's uh, storage between 2 to 8 degrees. Uh, it does require um, a diluent as well because it's freeze-dried. Uh, the side effects are mild and are very similar to, to, to the other vaccines in terms of the, uh, the, the side effects that have been reported with this vaccine. And then finally, the uh, Moderna vaccine. Uh, this vaccine is an mRNA vaccine, similar to the uh, Pfizer vaccine, with efficacy close to that as well, 94.5. Uh, Two-dose vaccine with the 28-day interval uh, administered in exactly the same way in the del deltoid muscle. Its storage is not minus 70, it's minus 20, which means it can be kept in the freezer. Um, and at the vaccination site, you can keep it between two to eight for 30 days, which is quite helpful. Side effects, similar profile to, to the other vaccines. And it also has polyethylene glycol, which uh, um, uh, would probably uh, uh, cause some allergies in people that are allergic to that. Uh, so similar side effect profile to, to the Pfizer vaccine. I will stop at that point, Dr. Manzi. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pele, for that very informative presentation. And now we will invite Ms. Milani Wilmerans to then take us through the electronic uh, system. Uh, this is obviously a very important aspect of the rollout strategy to ensure that everybody can be recorded and that we can keep track of everybody who is receiving their vaccines. Um, may I check that we are ready to share Ms. Wumaran's uh, presentations? Um, good evening, um, Luwazdi. Um, I cannot manage to share. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. I'm going to give an opportunity for the admin okay. to um, release. And um, Ms. Wormerans, ah, I can screen there. We I go. can share now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, good evening, um, Minister, Deputy Minister, um, DG, um, colleagues, um, panelists, everybody that's um, on this webinar. Um, it's my task to just give a very short overview of the EVDS. EVDS stands for Electronic Vaccine Data System. This is an integrated online system that will allow us to capture all the relevant data that um, is associated with the administration of the vaccine. It's a data secure platform. Um, it's an a platform that has been built um, with an enterprise architecture that complies with national and international security standards. We've built in quite a number of controls that will allow us to um, the system to enable processes for effectiveness and efficiency. I'm just going to give you a very short snapshot of the EVDS. So in terms of the electronic vaccine data system, um, the process for phase one starts here at number one. 
which will for healthcare workers to be enrolled for the vaccination. And this is linked to a electronic online application, which I will share more information um, with you just now. The second step is where the healthcare worker that has enrolled on this platform will be receiving a message to say that you have, um, you can go at this date to this place to go and receive your vaccine. The healthcare, the, um, healthcare worker vaccinee, in this case for phase one, will then go to that um, vaccination site with their ID book and their medical aid details, if they are on a medical aid. Um, they will also receive an SMS from the system to say um, that, uh, that they can take to the site. And on that um, SMS, there will be a vaccination code, which they will show to the vaccinator at the vaccination site. The vaccinator confirm that they are eligible to receive the vaccine and also confirm vaccine consent. After that, the vaccinator will give the jab or administer the vaccine. It captures the required information on the EVDS, um, records the vaccination code that comes from the SMS. The healthcare worker will receive a message, um, an SMS message that they have received the first dose of the vaccine and they will receive a message to say when they can receive their second dose. And this is the whole process for the um, EVDS in terms of supporting the vaccine administration. At the end of this, after the second dose, the, va the vaccinee will be able to access through a um, secure platform, an electronic vaccination certificate. And um, this whole vaccination um, process that is supported by the EVDS is also linked to the supply chain management so that we ensure that when a vaccine arrives at the vaccination center, there is um, enough supply to be able to vaccinate the vaccinees. Um, the next part that I quickly want to zoom in to, which is very important and that will go live very soon, is the online vaccine self-registration for healthcare workers. This is an online application that can be accessed via cell phone or via the internet on your computer. And it will just capture basic information to be able to then assign you or to tell you to which vaccination site to go, as well as on which date you can receive your vaccine. So um, we are saying that it's a vaccination appointment. Um, and they, if you register on this platform, you will get an appointment and you will be sure that you receive your vaccine at that um, vaccination site. Um, everybody, all the healthcare workers that register, um, they will just submit very general information. Um, and one of the um, 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 fields that they would complete is just the place of work. Um, we will then use this and we will then look at the, the registered vaccination site and then we'll allocate where the vaccines is available and we will allocate this individual to go to this vaccination site to receive their vaccine. <clears throat> the information that is provided on this portal, we will also use this to communicate with um, those that's registered on the portal about the vaccination program, where it's necessary, and the communication will be through this application. All healthcare workers, public, private, clinical, non-clinical, should register online on this platform. This will allow us to communicate with you when and where you can receive your vaccine. How will you know when this portal is alive and that you can register? There will be extensive communication to inform everybody, all healthcare workers through different platforms and mechanisms. Some of these that um, we've already um, started populating is social media, professional organization, healthcare worker, the employer of the healthcare worker, as well as the labor unions. And thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Ms. Wilmerans, for that. And I hope this has given the track all inoculees. Now, I have been requested to um, move the segment service delivery uh, model and funding to the end as Dr. Aquina Tulari is having activities and we'll see in circumstances that surround digital communications. Um, but what we will do then is that I will ask um, Professor Kolega Mnisana to then start getting ready to uh, present on myths and misinformation. Um, I see that Professor Mlisana has been enabled to be able to share her screen. I will give her an opportunity to do so. There we go. Thank you so much, Professor. Please, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manzi. And um, Honorable Minister and the Deputy Minister and everybody, you know, uh, all the colleagues on the webinar. It gives me great pleasure just to talk a little bit about... Um, the myths and the misinformation surrounding vaccines. And I'm smiling because um, there's a lot of information that's going out there and it can be confusing. But I think we really just need to, you know, um, make sure that we know the correct, we know where to find the correct information and we will be fine. And I'm trying to move my slides and I'm not sure why it's not moving. Uh, okay, all right. So I thought where I will start actually is just to define, you know, when we talk about myths and misinformation, what is a myth? It basically, you know, everybody knows that it's a widely held but false belief or idea. And I could not resist not to translate this. Yes, this is city myth in Ganeguan. He told us it called Labandaba in Ganes and Ganman's school. And in Kosa, Gutwa in Zomi which is really just a belief that we all know it is false. Now, what about misinformation? It is when there's actually, we're talking about false or inaccurate information. And there's even a new word that now is called disinformation, which talks to a false or misleading information that is spread deliberately and the emphasis being on deliberate. So we really need to be careful about disinformation as South Africans. There's a lot of talks about 5G and viruses, but really let's just be all clear that viruses cannot travel on radio waves or mobile networks. They are not able to do that. And therefore, the 5G mobile networks do not spread COVID-19. In fact, we all know how the viruses spread. And in fact, we have seen the continent. And you look at the rest of the other countries, the numbers of cases. So really, when we're looking at numbers, people are often associating all these myths with some of the US you know, um, as citizens. But if you're looking at the US, it already, it has got 30.5 million cases compared to 3.48 million cases in Africa. And as we all know that within our country, we've got 1.42. So you can see that the magnitude of cases is not in Africa, but it actually is in the US and in other countries as depicted by this uh, graph here. And secondly, what about death? This is the, the vaccine doses. But if you're looking at those that have received the two you know, uh, doses for, for those vaccines that need two doses, 6.56 million already have had, uh, have already been fully vaccinated. And so we can monitor, and there has been nothing untoward that we have seen thus far. So basically, we need to know that vaccination saves lives. And as uh, Dr. Pile showed, it actually, a vaccine, you know, the vaccine vials contain more than just one dose. It's all fluid. And so there is no way there could be a microchip or a tracking you know, device in those in that vial because that one vial will actually be used for more than, you know, there's some that contain up to five doses and even more. So really all vaccine ingredients, they get declared to the regulatory body. So when the uh, SAPRA, you know, um, uh, evaluates and looks through the dossiers of any company that wants to bring a vaccine, it's mandatory 
that the full ingredients that are in the vaccine are declared. So there is no vaccine that has got a microchip or a checking device. Will these vaccines alter our DNA? The answer is no. There's no vaccine that is going to alter the DNA. As Professor Shub has eloquently described to us how these vaccines work, if we're looking at the messenger RNA vaccines, all that they are, they actually are a set of instructions that then inform the cells of the body to make these proteins, which then the body responds to in uh, stimulating an immune response and prevent or fight the disease. So it is not going to alter the, 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 the DNA, not you know, in whatever form. And really, I just want, as I'm finishing off, to say, you know, we are a nation that vaccinates. We vaccinate our children. Every mother knows that they must keep their road to health chart and they go and vaccinate and get their children immunized. In fact, if you're looking at our childhood immunization coverage is above 80%, and this was in 2019. And therefore, my message tonight is that we need to know that even if the, the government can bring the best vaccines, Vaccines do not save lives per se, but it is vaccination. So it means we all need to line up to get vaccinated so that we can actually make a, an impact and, and make sure that we reduce and hopefully we get to a stage where we talk about um, herd immunity. And the last bit I wanna say you know, to us as South Africans, please let's get into the habit of checking whatever information that you come across. Don't accept things at face value. Don't believe everything that you read on WhatsApp messages, but check the facts and make sure that you protect yourself and you vaccine against COVID-19. Thank you very much, Manzi. Manzi, sorry. Thank you very much, Professor Mlisana. Your uh, authority and expertise is really an important voice and we really, really appreciate that you have come to share your message with us. Every mother knows that you must vaccinate. Um, now I'm going to invite Dr. Boitumelo um, Simede Mukukotlela, the CEO of SAPRA, to talk to us about the Section 21 authorization as well as safety and pharmacovigilance that is undertaken by the regulator. Um, CEO, uh, are, are, are you ready to share your slides or are you, are you enabled? I'm going to try again. Thank you very much, Dr. Loisi. I'm ready to share my slides. I hope Thank you, you very much, CEO. CEO. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just put it on. Good evening, uh, Minister. Um, good evening, um, members of the MAC Advisory and other colleagues, and good evening to the viewers. Um, so as indicated, um, SAPRA will share um, an update on the regulatory status of the various vaccines, but I'll do a deep dive on the specific one that has recently been uh, authorized. <clears throat> so in terms of applications um, that are currently in our pipeline, you've heard of a number um, that are still in development and some that are authorized by other countries. However, as we sit at the moment, we've got the Janssen vaccine um, that is currently under what we call a rolling review submission, and this is currently ongoing. We then have the um, Serum Institute AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, which we recently issued a Section 21 authorization on, and this is a vaccine that has um, market authorization, conditional market authorization by the European Medicines Agency. It has emergency use listing in the UK, and it also has emergency use listing in India. We also received an application from Pfizer for their vaccine, which currently has uh, emergency use listing in the UK, the US, as well as a WHO emergency use listing. And this is also under review by SAPRA. <clears throat> I'll do a deep dive on the Section 21 that, uh, process that we followed. Again, it is to give the public confidence, um, as Prof uh, Koleka was saying, that SAPRA follows quite a rigorous process in getting to a position where they determine the safety, uh, or safety efficacy, and quality of the medicine. So Section 21 is a mechanism that um, we utilize, and it's under the Medicines Act, 
to grant access to unregistered medicines. So this is what we, we, when you see with other regulators, they would typically call it emergency use authorization. What we do that with this mechanism is that we make a product available for a specific period of time that we determine. Um, again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's um, applied where there are conventional therapies that have been ruled out or that have failed or are, are unavailable um, in the South African market. They also, where we apply Section 21 is where there are specific quantities or specific individuals or patients that need to access the product urgently. And this is the case now with the COVID shield vaccine, wherein you note the specific quantities and a very specific cohort, wherein it will be rolled out in this initial phase of our national rollout program. Again, we issue it where there's adequate scientific data that clearly indicates the risk and clinical um, benefit. In this review process, we always have regard to the health product safety, efficacy, and banpilates. We're expecting about 1.5 million uh, doses, and that's what we've um, authorized. Um, and again, this is targeted to the health care workers. We went through quite a rigorous and a very thorough process at SAPRA. We put together uh, a working group of experts that are very, very much knowledgeable in the area of vaccines and clinical vaccine, virology, et cetera. And we looked at the following, the quality of the product, where the product is manufactured. We looked at its clinical efficacy. We also looked at um, its safety and post-access monitoring, which also includes pharmacovigilance reporting requirements. And I'll speak to these briefly. So when it comes to quality, we look at the manufacturing process, that is it an appropriately validated uh, process. In this case, um, because, the, because AstraZeneca had entered into a technology transfer agreement with the Serum Institute, we needed to ensure that the product that comes out of the Serum Institute is comparable to the product that is then uh, manufactured by AstraZeneca. So we had a lot of scientific data around that. We also, um, you know, looked at what we call the release specifications um, by AstraZeneca for this product of the Serum Institute. Again, when the product arrives in South Africa, we do what we call a lot release, and this is to test and verify the quality of the vaccine that is available in South Africa. So in this case, with this COVID shield vaccine, when the product leaves in India, it will go through a lot release by the Indian National Control Laboratory. When it arrives in South Africa, it will undergo a further lot release verification, and this will be conducted by our South African National Control Lab. These are labs that are all under the WHO guideline, and they always are collaborating on their protocols and on their processes. So we're quite comfortable with the quality of work that comes from both these labs. When it comes to the facility itself, we had to, again, ensure that we are quite comfortable with the quality of the manufacturing and that the manufacturing process, it, it complies with good manufacturing practices. So we reviewed the access acceptability um, of the site with respect to good manufacturing uh, practices. Again, this is a site that we have evaluated as SAPRA in the past. They have received a GMP status before. So it's a site that we are quite familiar with as a regulatory authority. We also did, when it comes specifically to this vaccine, we did an additional desktop review of the process that is specifically utilized to manufacture this um, vaccine. And we were quite confident and comfortable that it still complies with good manufacturing practices. Again, as I've indicated, this is a company that we've dealt with before, the Serum Institute of India. They do have GMP approval um, from SAPRA for, uh, from, for other vaccines that are available in South Africa, being the BCG vaccine, as well as the rotavirus vaccine. When it comes to the clinical efficacy of this product, we looked at the preclinical studies, as well as the phase one and the phase two clinical studies. We reviewed these and we found them to be acceptable and that the safety and the efficacy outcomes were acceptable. We also reviewed the early results of the ongoing phase three trial. And again, there's a trial that is ongoing on this product um, you know, in the country. And we were satisfied with the safety as well as the efficacy data 
that was provided from these early results from this phase three clinical trial. Very important because I know we'll probably get a question around how quickly these vaccines were developed. Are we certain um, about their safety? How are we going to ensure continuous monitoring? So we've got a very detailed program that we've put in place. And again, it starts with the manufacturer providing you know, periodic reports um, on what we call the worldwide database on a six, uh, a six monthly basis as these vaccines are made available across the world. Again, the manufacturer will provide us with a summary report of these uh, periodic safety um, updates on a monthly basis. But furthermore, we will be also getting and working very closely with the Department of Health to get reports on any adverse events following immunization. In our process as SAPRA, we also um, need to do an annual review of the drug safety information after the depletion of a specific um, stock. As indicated, the matter of the adverse events following um, immunization is quite important and we'll be working with the Department of Health in that. Where there are serious effects, we will receive these reports on a 24 hourly basis. We will then assess that and we will act accordingly. Where there are non-serious, as some that you've seen already been reported, we'll get these reports um, on a seven day basis. Furthermore, to ensure that we, we, we continuously monitor this product as it's been available um, to us as, as in, in South Africa, we will do what we call pharmacovigilance assessment of its safety. We will do very thorough reporting, um, monitoring, and we've put in place a reporting tool that will be utilized. And this is called the MedSafety app. This has been developed in partnership with the MHRA. This is the... Um, Health Products Regulatory Authority in the UK, and we're working with other African countries, again, around this medicine safety app. We've designed the app so that it's simple to use. It will be available on, I, uh, on Apple um, products, on Android products, but also it will be available on our website, as well as the Department of Health's website. In, instance, in instances where we don't have these digital platforms available, there will be a soft copy, uh, a hard copy document form that is available that will be utilized at the facility to report um, any side effects. And this is exactly the same form as what you see on our, um, that will be on our website. Again, there's been a number of awareness programs that have been held with um, healthcare uh, professionals around the profiles of these vaccines on how to report these um, adverse effects following immunization um, utilizing this app. Also, some of you may have heard about these breakthrough infections. So that it is where if you receive a vaccine, you may also get um, you know, uh, uh, infected. Again, because we are aligning the MedSafety app with the current testing uh, uh, um, web-based tool, we will be able to link the two and detect any uh, breakthrough infections. Issues such as causality assessment, so that's where we look at what is the relationship between a specific adverse effect and an individual having been vaccinated, we will do those regularly. And again, I can't stress the importance of having to report and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely engage uh, with the media, with the public around this med safety app in the next few days. So this app enables us to do a passive surveillance, uh, wherein you can spontaneously report utilizing your mobile device, logging onto our website and provide us with all the details around how you're feeling and if you're experiencing any adverse side effects. We can also utilize it to actively monitor specific um, recipients of the vaccine. And because of the way that it's structured, we are confident that we'll be able to get good quality data. It allows that we get report from their healthcare practitioners, but also from the public. So we're expecting quite a large volume of data that we will be receiving, and we put in together a team that will be analyzing this data and continuously advising us on what is happening as these vaccines are being rolled out. Again, we will be able to see um, trends and we'll be then able to make decisions quite rapidly as we get this data. So just to conclude, the key messages that we would like to share that as a health products regulator, we would like to give the public confidence that with this specific Section 21 authorization for the COVID shield vaccine, we've gone 
through a very rigorous review process with our expert working um, group that has extensive knowledge in this area. We also have worked and we continue to work with other regulators across the world that we align with and also with the WHO. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to the CEO of SAPRA and indeed let us take this opportunity to appreciate the regulator for getting us here. It is no mean feat to get us to this point where we are actually able to roll out the vaccines. I am now uh, told that Dr. Tulari is available for the most anticipated segment of uh, these presentations and that is the service delivery model. Now, while uh, Dr. Tulari is preparing her slides, uh, when she is done, uh, as the Minister of Health alluded to earlier, uh, the service delivery uh, model and the service delivery uh, strategy is a multi-sectoral approach. And we are extremely fortunate this evening to be joined by representatives of the together with the Department of Health in collaboration is very user friendly. I'm sorry, Dr. Banzi. I think we need to check your sound. It might be um, getting interrupted, but you can proceed. But I think there have been a few comments that uh, more people can't hear. So please just attend to it. Thank you. Please proceed, uh, Dr. Tulare. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, co-panelists and uh, honored guests. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation on a uh, funding cost recovery and uh, service delivery platform uh, for phase one of the vaccination rollout. Uh, the purpose of uh, the exercise of vaccinating is to achieve herd immunity against uh, the COVID-19 virus. And based on the advice that we have received from the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Vaccination, 65% of the adult population needs to be vaccinated uh, to ensure that the population has got the immunity that it needs. And if we look at uh, the South African population, 65% translates to 40 million people in the population. And uh, I'm going to break it down further that if uh, we think uh, we have got a, a, a 40 million people that requires vaccination, 7.1 million of these are insured in the private sector by medical schemes, whilst around 32.9 are what we call uninsured. If you look at the population of healthcare workers, which is going to be the purpose of this phase one uh, inoculation exercise, uh, we have got about 1.2 million uh, uh, public servants who are insured uh, or who are working in the public sector and uh, both uh, in health and other sectors, and about uh, 350,000 uh, are insured uh, in the public sector, and 170,000 belong to GEMS. Uh, the vaccine itself has been designated as a public good, and uh, it will be delivered free at the point of care, and its uh, delivery is based on the principles of social solidarity so that we look after each other, all of us in our society. The funding for the vaccine will be predominantly from the fiscus, but it will be augmented by private funding sources. And as indicated earlier on, there are various uh, sources from which we are going to procure the vaccine, and I'm not going to elaborate on these further. Also to indicate and to re-emphasize that government will be the sole purchaser of the vaccine for the national vaccination program and to secure access to vaccine, a government will ensure that we uh, do this 
at the lowest possible price that we can negotiate. An identified ent entity will receive the vaccine and act as a central distributor for the vaccination, for the vaccines on behalf of government. And this entity uh, will recover costs on behalf of government. As Milani had presented earlier on, we are uh, going to be using an electronic vaccine data system uh, that will coordinate uh, ensure that uh, faci uh, facilities that are accredited are on the system, that we coordinate a supply of vaccines, the pre-booking system and the vaccination itself, uh, recording who is vaccinated, who is not vaccinated, and also helping us with any other information that is going to be used for planning, execution and monitoring of the vaccination. In terms of cost recovery, we have got three approaches to a cost recovery mechanism. And this uh, entails looking at the insured patients, how we recover costs uh, from insured patients, how funding will be uh, meted out for uninsured patients, and also the participation of private sector, such as private hospitals, industries, uh, corporates that want to assist in augmenting the funding of uh, the vaccination program. Then I'm going to break down uh, this presentation into uh, what will happen to those persons who are insured. For persons who are insured, funding will be derived from medical schemes. And for these individuals or persons, uh, the vaccine will be administered free at the point of vaccination, at the point of service. In the private sector, private providers, including pharmacies, who want to uh, um, provide services to the insured persons, they will procure the vaccine from the central distributor through uh, their wholesalers using a mechanism that we call a single exit price. A single exit price is a mechanism that is defined in law through uh, the Medicines and Related Substance Act, Section 22G. So it allows uh, uh, the country and government to uh, publish a, a single exit price uh, from which we can uh, 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 buy uh, the services that we want to buy. Providers in the private sector will build medical schemes for the cost of the vaccines, as well as the administration fee, and will be paid through what we call a prescribed minimum benefit. The prescribed minimum benefit is, it, uh, is uh, described and contained in the medicines in the Medical Schemes Act, and it's a mechanism, one of the mechanisms for paying for benefits. We have already declared the vaccination uh, uh, for COVID-19 as a prescribed minimum benefit, which means that schemes uh, are obliged to pay for this service. Schemes will be expected to pay directly to those that are providing services, whether it's hospitals, community pharmacies, general practitioners, or whatever mechanism that we are going to be using to provide the service. And they are going to pay this through what we call alternative reimbursement mechanisms, uh, either prospectively or re retrospectively, but uh, it's going to be an inclusive fee and we call this a capitation fee. And in case of insured healthcare uh, uh, workers who want to be vaccinated in our public health facilities. The vaccine will be supplied to our pu public health facilities, but our public health facilities will uh, be regarded as designated service providers that can be paid by medical schemes. And they will be able to claim from medical schemes and the money will uh, come back into a, a government through a, a system where uh, the funds are retained and go back into uh, the fiscal via national treasury. As indicated, even for insured persons, they have to go through uh, pre-registration, uh, they have to go through uh, making a booking and uh, coming into a facility that has been assigned to them in line with what Ms. Volmarans escaped, uh, explained earlier on. So the electronic vaccine data system will be applicable in this instance. For uh, those uh, persons that are uninsured, 
And uh, I had indicated that uh, our uh, population, we've got 32.9 persons who are eligible for vaccination, who are uninsured. And of this, uh, even the healthcare workers, uh, there is a proportion of these that are not insured. For this uh, 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 component of the population, the public sector is the preferred provider for the vaccination. And since vaccination is a public good, government will provide funding for this uh, section of the population. Uninsured health workers will also be funded by government. And in other instances where, for example, they're in the private sector and there's a, public, a private employer who is willing to pay for their employee, they will be allowed to do so and uh, there is a mechanism that I will describe in the next slide of how they are going to do that. For the uninsured who are using uh, our public facilities, the vaccine will be received from the dis central distributor, but our uh, uh, provincial departments and our districts will not be required to pay for the vaccine from the central distributors. In the private sector, if our uninsured population wishes to access service through private providers. The private providers will have to purchase the vaccine through the single exit price mechanism that I explained earlier on, and they will be purchasing this through their wholesalers from the central distributor. But also of importance is that no person, uninsured person or insured person will be expected to pay when they access the vaccine. So vaccination will be free at the point of service. Where there is a need to augment the public sector capacity to provide services to uninsured persons, government may or will contract private providers based on need, their location, capacity, and other relevant considerations. This is not something new. A government uh, uh, has already embarked on contracting private providers for example, with the distri uh, distribution of medicines with a, chronic, a central chronic medicine uh, uh, dispensing and distribution si system, the CCMDD, where we distribute me medicines uh, to remote areas through contracted providers such as pharmacies. So these contracted providers, uh, as indicated, may include private pharmacies, general practitioners, and other providers uh, in line with their scope of practice. Uninsured persons who may wish to access vaccination services through public facilities or accredited private providers will also have to undergo a system of pre-booking and also uh, making an appointment and also for them to have their vaccination recorded and uh, collected into our EVDS. The contract that a government will be engaged, uh, get, getting into with private providers will include a, a, a portion for administration fee that uh, we have set between 50 and 60 rand per patient, and this will be inclusive of VET, and government will uh, reinvest this to private providers. Of importance also is that our uninsured persons will uh, need to have their identity document and we uh, have, uh, uh, as they are registering, if ever they are not on the health patient registration system that is already in existence in our facilities, then this will be activated so that we are sure that we are identifying the correct person. Then uh, I had indicated that, you know, a private sector or corporates may wish to also provide uh, funding and services for their employees. It is important that we recognize the participation of the private sector because if we want to achieve herd immunity, we need to have a collaborative effort amongst all of us, amongst all key stakeholders. And business funding should be aimed at ensuring that we cross subsidize the cost of herd immunity and the associated social and economic benefits of a uh, achieving this herd immunity. And a business may also opt to make a contribution through an identified mechanism to ensure that this herd immunity is achieved. 
Business uh, has indicated that uh, they would want to opt either to cover a population of the unemployed, uh, uh, the, the population uh, that is uninsured or the population that is uh, residing in the vicinity of the places uh, of work. And this they may do through their occupational health care services that are available at workplaces or through contracting for such services. If ever services are procured uh, for a delivery of the vaccination uh, through the private sector and corporate mechanism, uh, they will have to procure the vaccine through the central distributor using a wholesaler also at a single exit price. Uh, what we also want to and, uh, be clear about is that if communities uh, or employees are vaccinated, they are going to receive their vaccine free at the point of service and the business or corporate will bear the cost. Persons wishing to access vaccination may do so uh, through their workplaces or if ever the employer identifies an accredited provider, whether it's a GP, it's a nurse a practitioner or it's a pharmacy, they may do so, but uh, they are also going to be required to register through our electronic vaccine data system and with pre-booking and recording of all the vaccination activity. In summary, therefore, let me say that if we have the public sector as a delivery platform, I'm going to break down uh, what will be the role of medical aid uh, schemes, uh, the service providers, uh, where the stock will be coming from and the type of reinvestment. So for the public sector health facility, personnel who are on medical aid will have to be uh, uh, funded through their medical schemes. The services that are provided in the private uh, public sector hospitals or facility will be delivered through a vaccination team. And uh, I just want to remind ourselves, we had said that the public sector must be a designated service provider for a scheme such as GEMS or any other scheme that is uh, not GEMS. Uh, there are lots of other schemes that are covering public health sector uh, employees and uh, these may also uh, uh, be a part of the process of uh, paying uh, the service provider, which will be the public health sector facility. The stock here will be public, but a reimbursement will uh, derive from uh, the schemes and it will uh, be retained uh, by treasury through uh, the DSP arrangements. For those personnel that are without a medical aid coverage, but they want to be uh, receiving the service in the public sector, the services will still be delivered by a vaccination team. The stock will be none, but there won't be any need for reinvestment since these are uh, persons or uh, the category that will be funded directly through the fiscus. If the service is delivered in the private sector and the person is on medical aid and uh, the services will be provided by the private health facility, the stock will be private it will be procured through a, a, a single exit price from the central distributor a, via the wholesaler and the provider will submit its claim to the medical scheme and the medical scheme will reimburse the provider. The fiscus will uh, retain uh, the funding through uh, the initial mechanism of purchasing from the central distributor. For personnel without medical aid, there are two options. Option one, where uh, the uh, uh, ser uh, services are provided by an employer through the occupational health service facilities at the workplace. The stock in this instance will be private and uh, the employer or the one uh, who is going to be providing uh, the service, either the corporates or other uh, 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 private uh, role players, they will uh, purchase uh, their stock of vaccines from the central distributor at a single exit price and uh, the employer will supply the vaccine to the workplace or to an identified uh, service provider. And uh, the employer or the corporate will have to reimburse those that are providing uh, services at their occupational health uh, facilities. The other option is to refer those that are without medical aid 
back into the public sector, which is the preferred option for delivery. My last slide. If ever we are looking at a variety of platforms that we can use also to deliver, we have identified a critical component as private pharmacies that have got a guaranteed cold chain in their facilities. And they may opt to look at after medical aid patients or those that are without medical aid. In this context, the service provider will be the pharmacy, the stock will be private, and the pharmacies may either purchase as a group through uh, their uh, group uh, purchasing mechanism, but they will also be purchasing from the central distributor at a single exit price and medical schemes will reimburse directly to these uh, pharmacy or pharmacy groups. If ever the person comes into a pharmacy but they do not have a medical aid, the pharmacy will have a stock that is derived from the public pool and they will be reimbursed by the state a vaccine cost with or without an administration fee. This uh, will depend on the negotiations. And this will be similar to the central chronic medicine disp uh, dis uh, dispensing and distribution system that I described earlier on. Therefore, let me thank uh, the minister, the deputy minister, colleagues, and everyone for listening. I thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Tulari, very much for articulating the service of delivery model. And now, as we alluded to earlier, may I invite our partners to come through. I'm going to introduce each and every one of them. We will ask Dr. Zodra Ngobese to first uh, come through. Uh, Dr. Ngobese is an occupational medicine specialist running occupational health services for various parastatals and private entities throughout the country and in the private sector. She is also a health risk management specialist in the private sector. Uh, Dr. Gobese, please unmute and let us see you and uh, please do come through with your contributions. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Honorable Minister, the Deputy Minister, colleagues, fellow panel members, and fellow South Africans for this opportunity to support phase one of the vaccine rollout. All protocols of that. Occupational medicine services, we play a vital role in public health as a whole in that we are the healthcare professionals working with employers in corporates, private sector, and public entities to manage work-related health issues and exposures. And we also provide primary health care services at the workplace. For that reason, COVID-19 has become one of the risks that we manage on a daily basis. It has become our so-called new normal to deal with the management of the risk of COVID-19 on productivity, quality of life, morale of employees, and the workforce as a whole. For private employers who opt to fund the rollout um, and also for corporates, occupational health practitioners are well placed to be their foot soldiers. So we look forward to the delivery of um, COVID-19 rollout program. We view it as a game changer towards prevention of COVID-19 infections, not only locally, but also globally. And we wish to place on record that we wish to be the active promoters of this program in the workplace because we believe that the health promotion we give to employees can also be shared and add value to their families. So we recognize that our country needs all hands on deck um, and we fully support the program in its efforts to ensure and promote high levels of uptake of the vaccine in the country. We are a resource that has the capacity to do that. As uh, some people say, we can, you can, we all can. Therefore, we wish to support government and enable our country to achieve herd immunity as quickly as possible, because we view the vaccine as the one critical public health measure toward stemming the spread of COVID-19 countrywide and globally. For that reason, we wish all South Africans to utilize 
existing health resources, including occupational health practitioners, as a source of information that will enable them to make decisions on whether to participate in the program or not. I thank you for these few minutes of your time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Ngobese. Let's uh, move right along to Dr. Tutula Balfo. Now, Dr. Balfo is a private, uh, sorry, a public health medicine specialist and the head of health for the Minerals Council of South Africa. Very important figure in the landscape of healthcare in this country. Dr. Balfo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Honorable Minister, the Deputy Minister, all protocol observed. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, there is no doubt that uh, business, which is BUSA and B4SA, and the mining sector in particular can play a major role in the end-to-end -end planning and rollout of the vaccine program to assist government and the nation. Uh, we see this as a very critical national effort Business has stepped up as it has done in the past to offer its support to government in the distribution of vaccines to, in our case, mining employees and mining communities in line with the clinically established national priorities. As Professor Mlisana had said, uh, the key here is that it's not vaccines that are going to save us, it's vaccination. And therefore, our collective priority and responsibility as a nation is to get as many jabs in arms as possible, as quickly as possible, to save lives and livelihoods. Hello. Using our, using our significant healthcare infrastructure and capacity, business, including yeah. the mining sector, <laughs> Good. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Buffett. Yeah. Dr. Buffett, please just post it. Right. Um, Dr. Ngobese, please. Let me just mute. D Dr. Manzi, you are mute, and I think Dr. Balfour is also oh. muted. Oh, okay. Dr. Balfour, apologies. We just needed to uh, mute uh, Dr. Ngobese. Please, please do come back and continue your contributions. Thank you very much. Can you hear uh, me? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Balfour. Please continue your contributions. Thank you. We can hear you and we can see you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I, was, I was saying that, you know, as business, which includes the mining sector, we've got significant healthcare infrastructure and capacity, which can be used to drive the vaccination process. And we hope to be designated as key points of care. It is time for agency and also partnership and will play an important role with government and with trade unions. If we have the vaccine, we've actually worked that out that the industry can administer about 60,000 to 80,000 vaccines a day. So within two months, we could vaccinate between 2.5 million to 3 million people. We currently have a workforce of 450,000 people. So it would mean that we would be vaccinating at least five more people you know, per employee that we have. As business, we actually look, we will look at how we will best support the funding of the vaccine program. I was listening to Dr. Tulare and the various permutations regarding uh, support that can be provided. We are ready to step in, you know, where required to support the funding of the vaccine program. Lastly, a huge area we believe that we can make a difference on will be placing a focus on communication and education and reassurance of employees and communities and ensuring that as many people as are able 
will take up the opportunity to be vaccinated. As we heard before, the critical issue here is to get herd immunity in South Africa, and we want to be part of achieving that goal. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Balfour. And uh, it really is very reassuring that the sector has got so much capacity, not only to communicate, but also put chaps in arms. Thank you so very much. We'd like to invite Dr. Nyati, uh, may be very well known to some of our viewers, television viewers. He's a family uh, personality and advocate on TV and radio, social commentator, and host and owner of Dr. Hundi Digital Health Channel. Dr. Nyati, the floor is yours. Good evening, Chairperson, uh, Honorable Minister, Dr. Zulini Mkize, Deputy Minister, uh, Dr. Joe Patla, uh, eminent experts and uh, co-panelists and uh, many distinguished participants within this webinar. Um, um, I've been asked to come and talk more as a primary care physician, um, you know, which is uh, other people can see those as uh, family doctors, uh, but I play a role at different levels. One, yes, uh, at primary care level uh, in communities, but also, um, you know, I have a company that plays a role in health risk management or employee health and wellness programs that is in workplaces, and then also the role uh, as um, uh, somebody who's got a digital channel and uh, you know uh, gives opinion on media. Now, I think uh, listening to Dr. Tulare, it's very important that uh, primary care doctors, that is uh, GPs, uh, you know, individually and also as groups should be roped in to play a positive role. Uh, because if you look at the number of doctors that this country has, the majority of doctors are actually primary care you know, uh, doctors, they are the nearest people to the communities. Uh, they have uh, established relationships and trust uh, by those communities. Uh, and if, you know, they are able to speak the local languages, they can play an important role uh, in terms of public health education around the vaccines, answer questions, uh, the myths, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, and so I'm saying uh, for this program, to succeed, uh, you know, and make sure that by the end of the year, the two thirds or six, seven percent is achieved. Uh, we need to have the primary care physicians playing an active role. Uh, they can make their practices available, you know, as, as, as vaccination sites. And if they meet standards in terms of cold chain, they can be able to play a role to actually vaccinate, you know, people. Uh, and so I'm saying, um, you know, that engagement with organized primary care physicians needs to happen. Uh, obviously, a lot of training that needs to take place uh, so that they can play the roles that uh, I've just mentioned. Uh, and then some of us, we also play a role in media where we influence a lot, uh, you know, in terms of dealing with misinformation, disinformation, and, uh, you know, uh, demystifying the myths. So uh, in all of those roles that we play, uh, workplaces, in the media, and in our practices, uh, I think uh, it's going to be very important for the department to partner, uh, you know, with this sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Kundian. Indeed, we do agree that the role of the family physicians, particularly the community family physicians, is particularly critical, not only in ensuring that we do achieve that herd immunity we keep talking about, but also in, in their ability to be able to communicate with the community members that they are so close to and they know very well. And they know all their families and the uncles and everybody. Exactly. So very, very important role that they play. Thank you very much. We'd now like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Milani Da Costa, who is the Director of Strategy and Health Policy at NetCare and a member of the Private Sector Coordinating Committee of the National Coordinating Committee of the Vaccine Rollout. She also participates in the B4SA platform for vaccines. That is the Business for SA platform for vaccines. Uh, Mr. Costa, the floor is yours as representative of the private sector and business. 
Many thanks, Chair. So good evening, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, co-panelists, and honoured guests, and all protocols observed. So Business for South Africa was incepted in March last year. It represents the depth and breadth of both large and small businesses, and it's with the express purposes of supporting the national response to COVID. And the vaccine is uh, you know, part of that process. So I just want to support uh, or echo the minister's words on the pressing need to vaccinate healthcare workers. You know, we've unfortunately seen such a tragic loss of lives in the first two waves of these pandemic uh, of the pandemic, uh, and these are heroes, frontline staff that are trying to do the best they can to help our citizens and have a, an unintended consequence in the process. I can confirm that private hospitals, in particular, have been working hand in glove with the National Department of Health on ensuring a very successful start to the vaccine process. The reason for this is acute hospitals will be testing the IT systems and the logistical processes as we roll out effectively the first stage of phase one. And we look after the healthcare workers closest to the most compromised of COVID-19 patients. So in that we've engaged on the IT systems that have been presented uh, and, and um, eloquently elaborated on by Milani and Dr. Tulare. Uh, and Minister, we give you some comfort that um, the system looks uh, very comprehensive. Uh, today, we have finalized the, the uploading of the acute hospital vaccination sites uh, into the system. Uh, and we have started the training process of vaccinators through the National Department of Health Program. Uh, the next step, so we have also engaged the provinces on just understanding total private healthcare worker by province, by district, and even by acute hospital. We are now in the process of finalizing the registration of all the healthcare, of private healthcare worker data fields for that national electronic system. We're doing it through a central database to really try and make the department's life um, easier, and we'll be uploading it through a secure platform. The next step that we're also focused on is the logistics. And I see that there are a lot of questions that have been coming through on logistics. But in effect, if a South African gets an invitation for a vaccine and there is a set date, time and place, we want to ensure that when you arrive and you consent to a vaccine, that that vaccine is at said place. So those are the various steps that we're engaged on. And we would just assure you that we are available 24 seven to ensure our readiness to vaccinate healthcare workers. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Costa. Those are very, very encouraging words. Uh, the uh, carriages of this train are really starting to click together and that is extremely encouraging. We would like to now invite from the nursing sector, probably the most critical and important sector in the rollout uh, of these vaccines, uh, Matron Diana Morbedi, uh, she is the nursing manager in the Eastern Cape Department of Health, also known as matron of the province, with 41 years experience in public sector nursing. She has been part of the team that provides psychosocial support to healthcare workers affected and infected by COVID-19 in the province and is a leader in the nursing sector. And so matron Morabedi, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Good evening, Minister, good evening, Deputy Minister, and my colleagues. It's an honor to speak on behalf of nursing tonight. In my whole 41 years as a nurse, I've never seen such high infections amongst nurses. I've never seen such high deaths amongst nurses. We used to hold services for nurses, uh, nurses day, and we'd read out the nurses that have died in that year. In a hospital, you will read out maybe one nurse, two, three nurses, but that we should start reading up to above 20 nurses in one institution that have died. This is really broken the back of the nurses. We always said nurses are the backbone, but our back is broken. But I'm encouraging our nurses that with the vaccine, the issue where we used to say, the patient is my first consideration. It's no more about the patient. It's also about my family. My family needs to be protected. I need to, when I'm at work, be comfortable that my family is also protected. So taking the vaccine will not only ensure that I'm protected from getting infection, it will also protect my family. 
I will feel safer that my family is also protected because I've seen colleagues, nurses can attest to that, of nurses who are not at work. She was here the, the yesterday, today she's not here. She's infected. The third day she has died. So that is, that is really encouraging us as nurses to take the vaccine so that we are protected, so that we feel safer in our workplaces. Because at the moment, we do not feel safe. We don't know when next we'll be infected. Despite the PPEs that are there, despite the encouragement from management that are there, we still see our heroes falling. Day by day, there's a hero that has fallen. Day by day, there's a nurse who's infected. So nurses, let us protect ourselves. Let us protect our families. Let's, let's be encouraged to take the vaccine. And I must say, I've noticed that nurses are part of the teams that are going to implement the vaccine and they will be able to participate so that all the healthcare workers that we are aiming to vaccinate are vaccinated. Thank you this evening that I'm able to encourage our nurses and I'm hopeful that they will see the benefit of the vaccination. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matron. And uh, that was a very, very important, critical message for our most prized and most critical healthcare workers. Um, we would now like to invite Dr. Stan Mulwabi. He's no stranger. He has joined us on several webinars. And of course, he is the principal officer of GEMS, and he will be talking on behalf of the funders. Um, Dr. Mulwabi, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, Mel Loazi. Uh, good evening to the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Suelini Mkise, Honorable Deputy Minister Joe Pasha, uh, the DG, Tatebu Telesi, the DDG, Dr. Anban Pillay, co-panelists and members of the media who are present. We are indeed honored to be afforded this opportunity to participate in this August, August occasion. By August occasion, I'm actually referring to both the webinar we are having tonight, but also to the program of the vaccine rollout. Without further ado, on behalf of GEMS, we hereby pledge our unfettered support for this enormous undertaking. Anybody who undertakes a massive project like this one, this vaccination initiative, must expect that there will be challenges along the way. We must expect and overcome what the naysayers say. And they are saying that we will not succeed. We must expect that there will be various hindrances and hiccups along the way. More importantly, but in no way of less significance, is the trust deficit that has resulted from the recent undertakings of similar nature. The procurement of PPEs and recently the sanitation or defogging of the Houghton schools at a cost estimated to be around 430 million rands does not bode well for an undertaking of this nature. At this stage, I would love to say a word of appreciation for the healthcare workers who are at the forefront of fighting this pandemic. The road ahead is therefore littered with immense hindrances. However, we dare not fail the South African citizenry. I would love to leave you with the words of our icon, the indomitable Holitata Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it is done. I thank you, Dr. Loazi. Well, thank you very much for those words, uh, Dr. Mulwabi. And now, last but certainly not least, and then after the speaker, we will move on to the question and answer session. We will invite Mr. Khabo Gomabe, who is a community pharmacist and chairperson of the Independent Community Pharmacy Association, representing more than 1,100 pharmacies across all the provinces. And we all know just how important the community pharmacy is to ourselves as our daily lives. 
uh, the diverse uh, services that they offer. And now they are about to add one more critical service to their portfolio of offerings. So Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Kumabe, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manzi. Uh, thank you for the flattering introduction. Uh, greetings, Honorable Minister Nkise, the Deputy Minister, Dr. Patha, the DG, Dr. Butelezi, the DDG, Dr. Pillay, colleagues and fellow South Africans. My name is Khabu Komabe, and I'm the chair of the Independent Community Pharmacy Association. Firstly, I wish to commend the Department of Health, uh, yourself, Minister, and the Ministerial uh, Advisory Committee for the tireless work that you have been doing and are continuing to do, and for allowing us to be part of this important initiative. Now, the COVID-19 vaccine we see it as the most important tool that we have at this current juncture to end this crippling pandemic. And it is Im imperative that we vaccinate the 40 million South Africans as quickly as possible to avoid further loss of life and trauma to our nation. Minister, between ICPA pharmacies and our fellow colleagues, the GP practices in the private sector, we are indeed ideally placed to add over 10,000 extra vaccination sites across our country. Now the vaccine rollout and the massive spend that, will, is, that is happening currently and that will continue to make in this country should indeed strengthen the existing healthcare infrastructure and it should not necessarily be used to generate profits for shareholders. Finally, Minister, in solidarity with government and for the sake of our population, the ICPA together with our partners have been preparing for the past few months through engagements in the B4SA, the engagement with the Provincial Department of Health as well as the National Department of Health. And therefore, I conclude by saying we are willing, we are able, we are ready to play our part in this vaccination campaign. Pharmacies are indeed undoubtedly the backbone of primary health care in our country, and they should be commended for that. I just want to end by saying, South Africa, we encourage you, let's vaccinate and save lives as well as livelihoods. I thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kumape. And that ends the formal proceedings of this press briefing. Uh, we will now move on to the question and answer session. I will begin with the questions that are being posed by the media on my, uh, uh, on my WhatsApp groups. And then we'll move on to the Q&As that are in the chat, uh, in the chat box. Although we must put out the disclaimer that it will be impossible to cover all of the questions and answers that have been posed, but we've also tried to maybe group them all in themes so that at least we are able to exhaust everybody's queries regarding the rollout strategy. It is quarter to 10 and uh, the live broadcasters may elect to uh, switch over to their normal programming once the 10 o'clock hour strikes. And so we really would like to take this opportunity before we go ahead with the questions to thank our broadcasters for taking the message of government and our partners, our sector partners to the people of South Africa to reassure them that we're all working together to ensure that they will be protected from COVID-19 in the future through the vaccination program. Now we'll move on to the question answer session and I will begin uh, with um, Kyle Cohen from News24. Uh, does the health department have all the supplies ready it will need in terms of auxiliary supplies such as cotton wool needles, syringes and swabs for the vaccine shots to be administered how will these supplies be procured? And if I may, I think I will ask uh, Dr. Anban Pillay 
to perhaps tackle that one. Um, then we have a question from Nadia Hanbo from NATFIT24. Um, how will you check that a registered person is a frontline healthcare worker? What measure is used to ensure only frontline healthcare workers get prioritized during phase one? She has a follow two follow up questions which say, what is the estimate timeline for the start of phase two? And how do you classify people with underlying health issues? Are there fixed parameters? The third question is, at which point will companies be able to be part of mass immunization of employees? And will this be possible by winter of 2021? Can companies also provide vaccinations for employees who have medical insurance? Dr. Tulari, I think I'll ask you to tackle Nadia's questions. Um, Estelle Ellis from the Daily Maverick asks, will foreign doctors working in SA also qualify for vaccination. Um, I think maybe Dr. maybe you can also uh, handle that one or Dr. Anban Pele. And then we have a query from Christian Duplessis uh, from NetVac24. Apparently the AstraZeneca vaccine is sensitive to light. What plans are in place to ensure it does not get damaged? Uh, Dr. Anban Pele. Um, and then last one from this set of questions is from Tamar Khan from Business Day. How will the private sector rate for vaccines be determined that is how will the scp be set for each vaccine and at one point will the president and members of cabinet be vaccinated uh, uh, honorable minister perhaps uh, that second part of the question can be yours and the first part of the question can be taken by dr Anban Pillay. and she has a third question which is has the definition of essential worker been determined for phase two and does it differ from the essential worker list defined in the lockdown regulations uh, uh, thank you, panelists. I will uh, stop there for now and we can take the answers to those questions. Perhaps we can begin with the Honourable Minister and then move on to Dr. Anban Pele and then Dr. Tulari. I thought mine was the last one. <clears throat> uh, the the, the question of ministers uh, is actually an interesting discussion. On the one side, we have had uh, people who have said that the uh, ministers and uh, parliamentarians must be in the forefront and uh, they must uh, do so. Uh, so because some people were very skeptical just to give confidence. On the other hand, others are also saying, well, <clears throat> why don't they wait for their turn on the queue? Others are saying that uh, let's deal with the health workers and leave the political leaders for later. So we are going through that discussion just to see what might be best. But we believe that uh, particularly those who are involved in the interministerial committee uh, on vaccine uh, should actually be actively involved and they may be the ones that might uh, uh, be encouraged to participate in the earlier part of the, of the vaccine, mainly to uh, you know, uh, uh, build the confidence that uh, uh, the issues of vaccine uh, it's important issue is the uh, safety and the fact that it's important, it's necessary for all of us to take. So basically lead by example, as it were. So that matter has not been finalized, but uh, that's where the discussion is at the moment. Uh, we did say earlier, there was some uh, someone who asked a question about when the vaccination will start. We did indicate in my opening that there will be uh, a lot of processing that needs to be done and the minimum is 10 days, maximum 14 days. That's the timeline within which we expect that uh, the vaccine will be in, uh, you know, uh, will be administered as soon as all of the processing would have been done, minimum 10 days. And so uh, all the timelines are, are, have been put out there. So we, we anticipate that it should be possible around the second week of uh, uh, February. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Dr. Pillay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manzi. <clears throat> so the, the, from the questions I have, um, Firstly, on the question relating to supplies, I think it's important to recognize that the supplies that are going to be used are, are used in the health system currently, and there are a number of contracts available to procure these, uh, these uh, uh, items, such as needles, syringes, swabs, uh, uh, PPE, et cetera. Um, uh, it's also important maybe to bear in mind that we currently have an extensive vaccination program that... Uh, uh, comes to close to 20 million South Africans every year that are vaccinated or doses that are that are administered. So um, uh, the health system is quite used to uh, the vaccination program. Clearly, 
this is at a scale that's much higher than, than, than we uh, previously uh, delivered. Uh, but in terms of the specific supplies, uh, we have uh, quantified them, we have informed the suppliers and the provincial health departments will engage with the suppliers to order from those suppliers that have been contracted to supply these items. We understand that there will be sufficient supplies of them. Um, on the question about foreign doctors, well, all health prof uh, healthcare workers that are working on the platform will be part of phase one. Um, whether they're of South African nationality or not is, is not is not relevant because they're healthcare workers working on the platform and we will we'll, uh, deal with that as such. Uh, yes, the, the, the question about the light sensitivity of the AstraZeneca vaccine is, uh, is noted, and I think there are a couple of other vaccines that also may have that challenge. The supplier is providing the vaccine in, in a packaging that protects uh, it against light when, and it will be stored in the fridge. Uh, so we anticipate that that uh, will not really be a problem, although during training, I think it's important for us to emphasize that point so that those that are involved with the vaccination program uh, don't take the, uh, the vials out of the packaging and expose them to light. Uh, how is the SEP calculated? The SEP is made up of a manufacturer price and a logistics fee and, and VAT. Uh, we, we have been uh, in discussions with the industry about what the manufacturer portion would be or what would be the, uh, the, the cost price of the, of the medicine as such without the logistics portion. And we're going to add that on uh, clearly so that it's, a, it's an inclusive price with VAT. That's the way we would uh, we'll be putting the SCP together in terms of its various components. And then finally, the question around essential worker. Yes, we, we're using the, uh, the uh, definition that's available uh, in the regulations. However, the Ministerial Advisory Committee has been engaging with other uh, inputs of uh, uh, stakeholders that have proposed that uh, that would need to be broadened given some of the implications of uh, essential workers in the context of vaccination. So I think uh, uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee may have a, a revised list around essential workers as we move forward. Thank you, I'll stop there, Dr. Manzi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pillay, Dr. Tulare. Uh, any, any questions that you're picking up on? I think uh, the question that uh, I, I, I wanted to respond to is uh, around when will companies be allowed to procure and vaccinate? And um, part of the reason why we've established the Vaccine Coordinating Committee, the National Coordinating Committee on Vaccinations, and uh, that committee, including a component of the private sector, is precisely to have the private sector uh, involved in uh, the planning of the execution of the vaccination program uh, in that sector. And therefore they are part and parcel of the planning. If they are responsible for healthcare workers, their healthcare workers in line with how we've categorized them will also be prioritized accordingly. But uh, the most important thing is that they need to participate. They need to ensure that the information is provided to the platform that is planning, planning for the program and that uh, we know who the health workers are. And then uh, going forward, once we move into the second and third phase of uh, uh, the vaccine rollout, they should also be part and parcel of planning so that uh, we do understand uh, the categories of the population that they intend covering. So they are part of the planning even at this stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Tulari. I'm moving on to my second group, uh, uh, and there are about five questions here. Uh, the first couple of questions are from Vickers Berger. The first question is partially covered, but uh, he's drilling down into a little bit more detail. The question being, which healthcare workers will be prioritized during the first phase of the vaccination process? For instance, will a nurse in the Nazareth Field Hospital receive a vaccine before a plastic surgeon in private practice? Also, do all healthcare workers, including plastic surgeons, dermatologists, psychiatrists, et cetera, qualify to receive the vaccine during the first phase or will some be ex exempted? If so, who and why? It goes on to also ask, will South Africa, and Mr. Perhaps this one is for you, will South Africa beat this pandemic by end of 2021? Please explain why, why not? Will we be able to vaccinate 40 million South Africans by the end of the year to achieve herd immunity? Is this a realistic goal? 
Um, I think uh, the, the first question in regards to the prioritization of healthcare workers, um, we, either Dr. Tulare or Dr. Anban Pele can take that one. And Bodrum from Associated Press asks, and Dr. and Dr. Pele, I think this one would be for you. Um, what is the price paid? Excuse me. Um, he asks, what is the price paid um, for the 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine? Did a serum charge a premium to deliver these vaccines quickly? Um, and then I have the last, another, another one from Vickers Berger from Netback24. When will the vaccination process have a significant impact on the infection and death rates? In other words, when can we expect to see infection and death rates decline thanks to the vaccinations? And uh, perhaps uh, we can ask a, a minister and maybe um, the Professor Lusana can weigh in on that one as well. And perhaps even uh, 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 Professor Shub, if you would like to weigh in on, on that fairly high level question. Um, one has just come through from Bevelin Makue. Um, what are some of the challenges expected with the first batch? And is there, is there a strategy to deal with any of these challenges? Uh, Dr. Pele, perhaps if you can go, uh, come in on that one. Um, and uh, I see she has deleted follow-up question and I have requested Stephen Brimler just to put on record that his question is very long I, we will provide a written answer for that question thank you I'll stop there the minister shall we begin with you um well the 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 the, the one question is uh, when do we see the vaccine if, uh, taking effect it's, it's obviously a very difficult question to uh, answer accurately to because it uh, depends on the rate of uh, vaccination. It also depends on uh, uh, what wave we are at at a particular time. And so we, all we can say is that uh, we're looking to a point where we would have the, uh, the uh, majority of the people as targeted being vaccinated and also that we've got evidence that we have actually beaten the surge at that time of the virus so that the virus is, uh, uh, you know, uh, not a huge threat and preferably should have actually been completely uh, removed or um, uh, it should have been completely defeated. But it's not going to be something that you can put a definite timeline and say that's the time it's going to be. So we're going to have to play it by how the virus, the, the pandemic plays out. We, we hope to vaccinate as many people as possible we also hope that uh, during that time we'll use the uh, uh, containment measures, the use of masks, the sanitizers, washing of hands and so on, until we can see that the whole uh, uh, country is out of the danger. Then we would know that by that time <clears throat> we will be, we will have actually been able to successfully fight off the virus. So it's something that we will actually go by observation of how the situation is panning out publicly. Uh, then the uh, other question uh, that that was raised, uh, I, th I think we dealt with the question of um, uh, 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 the I think the, the issues of pricing will leave to uh, uh, Dr. Anban uh, Dr. Anban Pile uh, to 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 deal with. Largely, from where we sit, <clears throat> we believe that uh, we have to do everything we can to acquire as many vaccines as possible and uh, vaccinate as many people as possible uh, so that uh, we are able to get much closer to the 40 uh, million uh, target. Uh, obviously, as they say in English, the taste of the pudding is in the, uh, put, put, is in the eating. So it's going to depend on a whole lot of factors uh, by uh, the end of the year, how many of the people would have been able to, to vaccinate. We have seen a number of countries that had uh, huge amounts of uh, vaccines uh, ordered and not being able to get as many of their supplies as they expected. So from uh, our perspective, our target is to get as close as possible to the 40 million. We may not be able to achieve it, but we really must have done as many as possible by the time. So um, uh, the target has to be set and left at 40 million. Uh, and we need to drive the whole program to be able to get as close as possible to that number. If it does not work out, <clears throat> uh, it will just be because then we can explain what would have been the problem. But it's not because we would not have set a target that really must drive this campaign as much as possible. Our real concern with this whole uh, um, 
uh, pro program is that uh, somewhere along the line, the, um, uh, uh, we've had a second wave. We don't know whether we'll get a third wave. Now, it's going to be very difficult to say we've got the vaccine, but we're taking our time. We need to really make sure that uh, if we've got the vaccine, let's drive as much as possible the campaign so that more people must be on the safer side of getting infected than, uh, than uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we would be risking that if there's another um, uh, resurgence, they would be affected. So it remains a realistic target. Uh, it's, a, it's a target which really is a, a tall order. We're going to have to push, uh, but obviously, uh, hopefully we'll get enough vaccines in the process. But if there are delays there, it will then affect the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Let's move on to Dr. Anban Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Manzi. <clears throat> um, the first question I'll deal with is the one relating to healthcare workers. I think it's important to appreciate that uh, in, in order for the program to start with the first set of doses, we need to start somewhere. And it's important that we start consistently across the country in the same place. And so we all agreed um, after um, uh, much discussion that we would start with, uh, with the hospital workers, then move to, to primary care and then into the community. And that's the order we'd be moving in. Uh, to make sure that uh, we, we have a consistent approach to, to vaccination. And uh, in that approach, I would think that uh, plastic surgeons work in hospitals and uh, they, would, uh, they would be entitled to, to vaccination there. So would uh, many of the other surgical disciplines that uh, would normally be, be, be working in a hospital environment. So they would be uh, vaccinated in that environment. The question around uh, the price we paid, uh, no, we didn't pay a premium for the for the 1.5 million doses. It is the standard price that uh, Serum Institute uh, charges uh, countries, particularly those that are in the upper middle income group. Uh, a friend of mine who works in the Ministry of Health in Brazil uh, saw the article about uh, uh, what South Africa had paid and uh, some of the uh, the perceptions, and just sent me a message saying uh, uh, Brazil bought their doses, I think, uh, um, a week ago. And they paid exactly the same price from the Serum Institute. So uh, this is not a, a, a different price that we paid. I also uh, have been engaging with other companies that are producing the AstraZeneca vaccine, and they've uh, been quoting us exactly the same price uh, that, that uh, uh, the Serum Institute charged us. So I don't think uh, it was a premium. I do know even in the private market in India, uh, the Serum Institute is, uh, is uh, charging close to 8 or $9 uh, for the vaccine within that market. So the, 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 there are differences in prices. They've uh, taken a tiered uh, uh, pricing approach uh, uh, in terms of that. Um, and I think that's, that's the reason why we paid a, uh, a particular price for the vaccine. What challenges do we see with the first batch? I think uh, uh, we, we are embarking on a vaccination program of adults. Uh, uh, no country in the world has had a, a vaccination program where they try to identify adults or all adults and try to vaccinate them. Uh, I think that's probably our, our biggest challenge in, in, in identifying the people and making sure that they, that they come through. There are some logistical challenges as well. Uh, the particular one is uh, we, we have a, a limited supply of vaccines and we need to uh, treat every dose preciously. Uh, that requires that uh, people are, are identified early who will be vaccinated. So when we uh, dilute a particular vial, whether it has five or 10 doses in it, we should make sure that we use every dose in there for, for a patient rather than diluting it. And at the end of the day, we don't have patients and discarding those doses, which would then go to waste. And so I think that those are some of the challenges we learn from. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, that process is quick and we're able to, to get onto a more efficient mechanism uh, after the first phase. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Pele. Uh, Dr. Tulari. I think uh, the question that I wanted to uh, respond to, uh, Dr. Pile has already responded to. All health workers are going to be prioritized. Uh, we may find that uh, we look at risk categories, starting with those that are exposed to aerosol generating procedures, such as intubation, ventilation. But uh, so it's not going to be a, a, a matter of saying whether you're a nurse or you're a surgeon but if ever exposed to an environment 
that uh, will uh, be uh, of a higher risk, then uh, you may uh, fall into the first category, but all health workers are going to be prioritized in phase one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Solari. Let me check if Professor Mlisane would like to weigh in or has Minister covered you, Prof? No, I think the Minister has covered it well. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. And Professor Barry Shu? Yeah, maybe I could just add, you know, when, when will we start seeing an effect of the vaccine? I think it's really going to depend on the particular population. Once that population reaches herd immunity, I think we've seen it uh, in the rollout programs overseas, for example, in Israel, the United Kingdom, uh, where, look, for example, the elderly, uh, once a certain level has been reached in that population, then one, do then one does start to seeing declines in various parameters in hospital admissions and ventilator and in uh, ventilator usage and mortality and so on. So I think as each phase, as one reaches that herd immunity, I think one will then start, start seeing the effects. But obviously for the whole population, it's going to depend on, on the, when one reaches the stage of herd immunity to see how the, how the effect is going to be on the whole population. Until that time, and we've seen also in the rollouts overseas, uh, we won't really see, we still will have the, the, uh, the waves coming up and we still will have significant infection. And that, as the minister said, we still will have to uh, keep up with the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Thank you. And on that, uh, Professor Shub. Now I'm going to move on to the Q&A section uh, on the actual webinar itself. Ten questions, and we will have a question from the chat, and then we really must uh, give an opportunity to the deputy minister and the minister to uh, just very quickly and succinctly summarise in vernacular for um, our uh, people who need to also be communicated to. Now, uh, there will be of these eleven questions. I think we'll only have about five or six because the others have been covered, and so I will start. Carolyn, that's low shading. What procedures will be in place to ensure that we preserve the integrity of the cold chain storage? Um, we'll then uh, move to Sibusi So Mabele. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think that maybe that first question can be taken uh, by uh, Dr. Andan Pele. Then we have a question from Sibusi So Mabele, Minister. What is the plan to eliminate the doubts from the community about vaccination? Um, we then have a question from Mohammed Kola. If the efficacy is about 70%, is it not correct that you may have to vaccinate more than 40 million to attain herd immunity? Uh, Professor Shub, I think perhaps if you can weigh in on that one and, and uh, maybe Professor Nisana as well, if she would like to. And then, we have um, a question asking whether um, the students, and uh, this is a frequently asked question, whether students will be considered for phase one or which phase will they be considered for? Uh, um, from Damien Mehu, in addition to questions on funding, what is the level of the cross subsidy utilizing the SCP mechanism? that the insured will pay, and will that level apply to the corporates who assist their employees? I'm pretty sure, Dr. Tulari, that you articulated this quite well, but perhaps if we, if maybe we can just answer the question there. And then, um, Minister, what are the plans to manage corruption in the process of vaccine distribution? Um, from Ronald Kellerman again, will the management of number of dosages given and number of vials used also be monitored as part of the electronic system, or will it still be managed on a paper-based system as with the other vaccine campaigns. Um, perhaps, uh, uh, Milani, if you, if you can perhaps uh, handle that question. Um, do we know, assuming we that will work against um, the, um, the variants, they call them mutations, but I'll correct, I'll take the liberty of correcting them and call them a variant. Um, and um, then the last question is, how long is the vaccination going to last in the human system to protect them? Again, perhaps Professor Shub can ask that one. And that's the end of the Q&A section. And uh, to pick up on a frequently asked question, uh, we, they, uh, the people still want to know 
uh, if you have had COVID, how long must you wait before you can get your vaccination? Thank you very much. Uh, we will end with this Q&A session before we move on to the Deputy Minister. Thank you. We will begin again with, with the Honourable Minister. Thank you very much. Um, let, let me deal with just two questions. Two questions. Uh, the, <clears throat> the issue of uh, corruption, uh, we have uh, uh, a number of work streams in the interministerial committee, and we've asked each one of them to look into the risks so that uh, we can identify the risks and deal with the issues early and uh, prevent corruption. We have also worked with uh, the uh, Treasury to reduce the level of uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, chain <clears throat> procurement pro chain process to make sure that we don't have too many people involved in the uh, purchasing of the vaccines. We also are going to be uh, uh, looking fairly closely at the area of uh, uh, at the area of um, uh, logistics, distribution, and storage, so that uh, there is no uh, <coughs> corruption there. We have already had a meeting with the Auditor General and tabled to uh, the office all the approaches that we are taking to make sure that at the end of it, uh, they can give us a, a sense of. Uh, uh, um, checks and balances that they might want to suggest as we deal with the risks associated with this process. We want to make sure that there's no corruption. In this case, we must actually, uh, uh, at the end of this program, we must all remember how well the vaccination program was executed, but not so much to be distracted by how much corruption happened at that time. We also have a, a team, uh, they, they, they call it Fusion, uh, is a team that uh, is supposed to uh, combine all the uh, uh, investigative arms of the criminal, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> criminal justice system, and uh, they will also be uh, brought very closely so that for any process that's going on, we can report early any uh, sign of uh, abnormality. So we don't have to go very far before investigations are started and action is taken. So that is the way we're looking at it. But all of us are quite clear that the issue of corruption should not define the process of uh, uh, this new vaccination uh, program. Then the other issue around the elimination of doubt in the community about the, uh, uh, the uh, vaccine, we are going to be going out on a, a massive program of uh, 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 information sharing, communication. Uh, uh, we also are going to be working together with uh, various leaders in, in society, uh, the, be they the um, uh, faith-based organizations or leaders in civil society and uh, different levels of government, provincial, uh, districts, and so on, uh, to ensure that uh, there is adequate information that's made available to the communities so that they can ask the questions and they remove the doubt about uh, the, um, uh, the vaccines, but also just to share information to make people understand how important it is to all participate in this vaccination program. We have uh, been encouraged to see the uh, research that's been released recently, indicating a large number of people are very keen on the uh, um, uh, vaccines and that the numbers of people who will really not take the vaccine is actually quite small. And so we will work uh, with all the leaders and stakeholders to make sure that we can assure communities about the uh, safety and the importance of uh, the vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Does Anban Pile? Thank you. Um, I think I had two questions. The one relating to uh, load shedding uh, certainly, there will be a risk of uh, electricity disruption in facilities where there's no generators, and uh, that will be a risk for us. So, uh, in the distribution of the vaccine, we'll certainly uh, note that and make sure that uh, we don't store vaccines in, in uh, um, those areas where there are no generators or, or, there's, or there's risks related to the supply of electricity. We will be using a hub and spoke model for the uh, supply and distribution. So to keep most of the stock in one central point, 
uh, where there is good electricity supply and good security, and from there move out into a district into various points where the, uh, the vaccination program would happen. Um, on the question relating to students in phase one, uh, this uh, uh, um, issue was raised by uh, the Department of Higher Education. The Ministerial Advisory Committee is uh, looking at this, and I think uh, we will probably have a, um, a clear uh, understanding of uh, which part of the, the first phase they would fit into uh, in terms of their vaccination program. I think those were the two questions for me, um, uh, Dr. Manzi. Yes, thank you, Dr. Pillay. Uh, Dr. Tulare? Uh, on uh, the issue of uh, the level of cost subsidization and uh, how it is going to be determined, um, uh, there are various approaches that uh, we have taken. The first one is uh, through a, a mechanism uh, of a single exit price where we'll ensure that uh, through the single exit price uh, we achieve a one on one or two on one, depending on a ratio that will be determined of uh, how uh, those that uh, uh, can cross subsidize will uh, do so for those that are not insured. But it's a mechanism that has been uh, discussed with uh, medical schemes and uh, the boards of trustees of schemes and uh, is a principle that is understood and that if we do not do that, um, what uh, may eventually happen is that we may not uh, achieve our level of herd immunity that we're envisaging. So uh, in terms of the exact figures, uh, I would say that uh, that will depend on uh, the various permutations of vaccines that we are going to, to be uh, receiving. And it's only when we've got exact uh, 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 types of vaccines that we can give an exact figure of what it is. But um, um, single exit price is a mechanism that is well defined and uh, it's in law. It's uh, uh, according to the Medicines and Related Substance Act, uh, section 22G, that uh, allows uh, for a mechanism of a single exit price. And we do this all the time, even for our other vaccines, where you may find that uh, the price Differential. It's such that uh, uh, the, pri the the pricing uh, in the in 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 those that are acquiring medicines or vaccines through an SEP, uh, there's a vari variability between what the public sector acquires uh, the vaccine for and the private sector. So, it's a principle that is well understood and it's commonly implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tulare. Melani, the uh, Walmarans, There was one question for you. Um, yes, thank you. So the system has been designed um, to link up with a stock management system. So as vaccines are being administered, um, it will be recorded and then there's a link with the stock management system at the facility as well as the stock distribution uh, from the distribution side. So it's an integrated system. What I presented was the part that mainly focuses on the vaccine administration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Shu? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Manzi. Um, you know, the, the issue about, heard about the different uh, efficacies of the vaccines, one, I, get a, I often get asked that, but I think you must remember that these uh, efficacy, efficiency um, calculations are really based on the trial data. In other words, when these vaccines underwent tri uh, tri clinical trials, and the numbers were really dependent on the numbers of individuals who got ill, and then comparing those who are in the vaccine arm uh, versus those who are on the placebo arm and doing those calculations. Now, obviously, when the vaccines go out into millions of people, that might be a little bit of a different story. That's the one point. The other point is that one also, it depends on the endpoints that one is looking at. So if one, if one is looking at the endpoint that it protects against minor illness, for example, you're going to get a lower efficacy than if, than if it protects against more severe illness. So I think one can't put too much store uh, on the differences between these vaccines. I think that we, we, we've done our calculations with the numbers and the numbers do depend on what's called the R value, which determines how infectious the virus is. And we've determined that if we do get 
the value that the um, that uh, that 67 percent or 68 percent we should reach herd immunity um, without going to too much detail on those numbers but that but that's how we have calculated it um, and if we do have a good vaccine which uh, both the AstraZeneca vaccine is uh, the Pfizer vaccine is has been shown by the clinical trials and we do get a high enough coverage we should get to herd immunity with regard to how long lasting the immunity is after vaccination, of course, we don't know that. It's just too early. The vaccines haven't been around for long enough. What we do know when we look at the immune response after infection, um, there is some good news because I've been, uh, the more recent uh, studies which are reported in the literature have shown that there's good immune response up to six months and even past six months, uh, both of the uh, antibody response as well as the cell mediated response. So these are both arms of the immune response. Uh, and also memory cells seem to also be a, a long lasting at least past six months. Now, longer than that, of course, we don't know because the infection hasn't been around for long, but probably the vaccine should give at least as durable and at least as effective protection as the infection. So I think we're pretty optimistic that we should get reasonably long lasting immunity. Probably not the same kind of durability as we get, for example, with measles vaccine, which is a different story, but at least for maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. I think we have to kind of wait and see. Um, but uh, there, there certainly should be a reasonably uh, durable immunity to be able to bring the infection down. If we have to repeat with my, with uh, uh, a recurrent vaccination, like we do, probably not as frequent as influenza, which is a very changeable virus, but maybe in, in, uh, in intervals of a few years, that remains to be seen. Then the other question about how, if, some, if someone is infected uh, or has been recently infected, should they be vaccinated? I think our advice is that if somebody has been recently shown to be infected or recovered, they should be. They should defer vaccination probably for about three months after they recover. Uh, in other words, to give a three-month period. There isn't any harm in it. I should mention that if someone does get vaccinated reasonably soon after they have recovered, there wouldn't be harm. But there wouldn't be any point in it because they would have immunity from the infection itself. So it probably would be better in terms of um, getting a longer-lasting, uh, more durable immunity to wait at least about three months after they've recovered from the infection before receiving the vaccine. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Shub. Prof. Lesana? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think actually Professor Shub has uh, uh, tackled a lot of the questions. There's just one that I thought I could also uh, address where people were asking, you know, can, will the vaccines be mixed in that if you get the, the first dose, are you likely to get a different vaccine for the second dose? And the question, I mean, the answer is that no. If you've got, you know, you'll get the two doses of the same vaccine. So vaccines cannot be mixed because remember, the trials have been done on the one particular vaccine. So we'll not be mixing the vaccines. But otherwise, I think most of the other questions have really been answered. Thank you. Thank you very much for addressing that particular question, Professor. And now um, we are now drawing to a close and I'm going to invite the Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Dr. Jo Pasha, uh, just to address uh, our compatriots in vernacular and give them closing remarks. Honorable Deputy Minister. Um, well, thank you very maybe, much. Maybe thank I you. will need to check if the Honorable Deputy Minister is back. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Minister. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know it's uh, as late at night, so I will not uh, uh, hold you for long. Just a few uh, for for our, our uh, Sutro speakers, those who might still be listening, just to rebativisa uh, or refikiles vakeng seu lelane o la rona la mo ento wa go thibela bolwetsi bya corona le go re shireletsa mo bolwetsi bo eh bo fitlile se mong se le ngo re re lokile se tse re lokile gore re tsa maise le nane o le eh re rata go ba khotsa wa re di tlaretse di ga o file go fitla tsa go tlo thibela bolwetsi bya corona mo ento wa go tlo tlhaba di tswana tsa go thibela 
bolaji bya corona eh majaji ama 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 ne go fika go matlano a tlang eh di tlaretse di tlabe fitlile mo Afrika borwa mo eh ke rata go tsiana nako e go gotatsa setshaba sa Afrika borwa gore di tlaretse re di tlisa mo ri to go di tlaba setshaba ka tsona tsa go thibela bolaji bya corona eh ke di ke di tlaretse di shireletse gile re go pela batho gore baske ba theletsa e ba tuwa le ngwe gore ba tsama ba bolela dipelo tse le ngwe ga di nanete tsa gore di tlaretse tsa o thibela bolwetsi bya corona di na le mathata di ka batlisetsa malwetsi ba 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 bolela ga pele gore e di tlaretse di tlo ba tsentsa malwetsi a fapaneng e rata go ba go thatsa gore e mosho wa lona o na le tsebo re kreile e ba tsibi ba di tlaretsetsa mo ento ele fase ka moka gore ba tisetse gore di tlaretse di bolokegile gape gape re na le le gotla la SAPRA South African Health Product Regulatory Authority ya bona mo South Africa mo e leng gore le tsa le bo se go ba ba ka tseno ba boletse mo gore di tlaretse ba di checkile e bile ba go di tsele gore di siretsegile so re re matsatsing a tlang mo gare ga go dia february eh ba ba shumedi ba tsa maphelo ba o ke di di nga ka le ba 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 shumedi ba tsa maphelo ba tla ba tsa ma le fasela south africa ka o fela ba tsa maisa di tlaretse tsa go enter re tlo thoma ka ba shumi ba tsa maphelo go di petleleng le di cliniking re la tele ka ba shumi ba ba shumela ntse tshaba re fetse ga tshaba ka o fela go merere ka o fela a reng wa di seng go re re tlo hwetsa mo ento o o tla re thusang go thibela boletsi bya corona ke a leboga thank you very much lazy uh, uh, thank thank you tawe and i just to reassure you deputy minister that uh, these sessions are extremely critical the broadcasters if they're not still taking it live now they will certainly be taking this recording and these do end up in a mainstream and community radio stations so really we we very much appreciate you uh, giving us uh, these remarks uh, even at this late hour i would now like to hand over to the minister and minister may i also request that in fact uh, once minister is done if, if minister can close the session thank you very much minister siabonga kulu total manzi si fisa ugudlulisa eh emphakathini wonke ukuthi lesimemezelo sana mhlanje besekuchaza ukuthi imigomo ebesilindele isizofika ilindele ukuthi fike umaqala inyanga ngomhlaka 1 okuzokwenza ukuthi kulezonsuku sihlaleke sihlolise ukuthi konke kufanele kuhamba ngendlela kufanelekile uma sekuphelele leso sikhathi kizobe siyakwazi ukudluliselwa ukuthi siqale ugoma abantu ngayo wona uhlelo sulibekile lokuthi ugoma ngokwe covid 19 kufanele kuqalwe ngalabo abasebenza ezikhungweni zezempilo ngoba izi for the covid 19 zifikela kubo kubaluleke ukuthi sibe nabantu abangamasosha abaphephile uma kuyiwa ezibhedlela sithola ukuthi abazogula abagulisiwe izi for esofika nazo ngaleyo ndlela ke sifuqala ngabo bonke odokotela abahlengazi abashanelayo abasebenza kuzo zonke inhlaka nje lapho bekwazi ukuhlangana khona nabantu abagulayo kubaluleke kakhulu ke lokho ngoba sizoqhubeka nabanye esizobanikeza ukuthi nabo bagonywe kakhulu kanje ngabantu abanje ngothisha amaphoyisa nabo boke abasebenza phambi komphakathi lapho bangani mabe sebenza batheleleke ngezifo abasebenza mahotela abasebenza endaweni ezinabantu abanesiminyaminyi konke lokho uzolandela kamuva ushuti ngale izinhlelo esenze ngazo uyoqala abezempilo bese kuza labo abasebenza abasebenza la umphakathi egcineni ke so bese kungenela kubo bonke abantu baseningizimu Afrika abangenazi izifo kodwa laba banezifo uzokudinga ukuthi siqale ngabo ngale sikhathi sibhekene nazo zonke inhlaka zabantu abasebenza lapho kune ingozi yokuthi bangatheleleka ilisiko eh inhlelo ke zonke zokuthi umgomo lo ubhaliswa ngokusemthethweni sesiwenzile ngakho ka mapepha sekufanele ukuthi kwazi ukufika sizothengeke enkampanini SAE SAE India October Islam Institute kodwa saqhubeka sathenga eminye ezinye inhlobo zemigomo ngoba akekho onemigomo eyanele ukuthi singakwazi ukuthi sithenge kuya kuphela ngakho ke 
tenga enda one sluga ene slindelu kuti abantu baba ngangezi kiteza mashuma mane okufane le sikune sasubani geze onke lo mtu wabu kukom kwa tage ngubuni ingi baba antu kushuti kuzo wakwenze kakusuela ngu februari kwa zikiyo pelu nyaga este mbutaba ni ngubo pesebo kwa zuti ngalisuskati bako wa zuktola ukukonyo kwa tage kubalulegi lunoma kutuwa ushelo lo koma lea kubela abantu banga ye kusebe nzisa isifonyo ma mask wana kusebe nzisi zanja sale zikeziwe Nukuta bantu bangu wa suma bimi leba kaka ne banga bine simu sugu tigu e basi inda wenye nesmi ni mi ngoba so zisua zubona katuti simu bile leko anamanga bantu abaning kwa choli nukuta ba kony so sachola futo kuti ne kwa nesele kile isi ina ina ni la lo kwenye nukuta kwenye bonga bantu bangu wa super pangoba noma sana zungu ni si fangoba mchambu kony u usenga wazu usulusela gumu ni mto ma mchambu tinda na nenda u and the people who are living in the world are living in the COVID-19. The people who are living in the world are living in the world. They 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 are living in the world. So zonkis in the fancy cycles good tea. In those two saban to Halo Con and Jungle Wooty, Sampa Mo five G, Conkelo, put a gunjalo, Balegila Spam Sanin, says Princess Sooty, Yon Angela Pelo, Utaban Banga Sinda, and King and Yale Likuane, Uma Wood Song as soon as the Princess Utaban Bacon. I learned the lagas of his spam son and Gumparati, Sisulego, Gaba Holy Bumparat, Abamabanda, Aba Holbin Dabugo, Aba Holbin Tangan Zumparati, Aba Sevens. Na wangu mtu usipa msani, tulisu miyale zuguta wa ntubaka wa zupepa, uleli kwa. Sia bonga kakulu. Thank you very much to all the panelists and to all the members of the media who have been with us and to members of the public. Thank you for, uh, very much for this session. We will find another opportunity to share, to share some more information as soon as we feel there's additional information that is worth sharing at that point. But thank you very much. Uh, we do know that it's taken much longer than we initially anticipated but we are really very grateful. We'll continue to share information. Where the information is inadequate for the uh, journalists and the media, please send the questions. We'll try and answer as much as possible, even after this session is over. Thank you very much to all. Uh, good evening, good night. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good evening. Good evening, Doctor. Uh, Prime Minister, Deputy Minister. Thank you, Minister. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Minister. Thank you.